So on this week's Swayu channel, we've got another amazing guest. This guest is an Academy Award nominated character creator and co-finder of Legacy Effects. And he also worked for the wonderful legend Stan Winston. It's John Rosengrant. John, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I am I, I'm literally honored because you have worked on so many movies, it's unbelievable. Your IMDB is my childhood, oh. my my teenage years, and my go-to movies uh, on a weekend. So it's going to be madness to try and fit a few of those projects in this <laughs> episode. So I do apologise to the audience if there is a film that we've missed, but you know this this episode can can't be four or five hours long, uh, or even longer. <laughs> um, so we'll try and get some of some of the pieces in. So I wanted to start out to you know finding out how you got into the industry because you know you joined the Stan Winston workshop and that is crazy in itself because literally that man in his workshop as brought so many great creatures and creations to life. So how did you start out in the industry yourself? So Stan was the first real big gig that I had. Uh, I have to credit the Makeup Effects Lab for hiring me on a movie. Uh, probably not the best movie, but it sure was a great movie to learn on. It was Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jaredson in 3D. But wow. what that did was it gave me an opportunity to meet lots of people and work with a lot of people. And some of those same people went on to tell Stan, hey, that guy's okay. You, you give, him a, give him a go to be on the crew. And I had I'd met Stan before that, and I kept bothering him to see if I could work for him. But everything sort of lined up on the Terminator, and that's was my first real big break and honestly i owe both stan and james cameron a, a major shout out for launching my career really and truly i mean what was your talent when you started out because i can't imagine anyone just to walk into stan winston <laughs> and say give me a job i mean you've got to have been True. talented in some area i mean how did you start was it was it just like art or was it sculpture it was, it was art, it was sculpture, it was painting, it was all, all those things. And, you know, I really wanted to be, become part of a crew. And from afar, I r remember in Fangoria reading an article about Baker's Half Dozen, and it was like six guys that worked for Rick Baker. And I thought, wow, that'd be great to uh, have that opportunity. And it came, it came for me, and that was with Stan. And I became... Stan's, uh, well, Stan was not only a mentor, but he was a friend and a great artist, and he taught me so many things. I was really blessed to have him take me on. I mean, working in that environment for Stan um, in the eight, the 80s must have been incredible. I mean, what, what was it like <laughs> in the workshop, you know, the environment? Because it pioneered so many projects that really has influenced the industry even to this day but in in the way of the bunch of people i mean i had um lorne peterson on last week and i i asked him about I, ilm and what was it like back in the 70s i mean what was it like in the 80s we all having fun or was it, it was the heyday it was the heyday of all these uh you know monsters and creations and practical effects it was the go-to. There wasn't CG at this point in time. I, I had a young director one time ask me what what parts of the Queen Alien were CG, and it's like people just don't know. You know, mm -hmm. no, there was no CG back then. That was 1985 when we were working on that. It came out in '86. CG was in its infancy. I think there was something in Young Sherlock Holmes at that point in time, and then not long afterwards. James Cameron uh, got the water tentacle going on in the abyss. And then mm. in its infancy, in, in T2, uh, we we utilized, worked hand-in-hand hand with ILM on a lot of CG effects. But before that, there was nothing. It was all practical. And you had to figure out how to do it, like a magic trick. You know, he, where the cuts he, would he be. And, 
and I'm sorry? it was and it was definitely magic because literally you made millions of audiences believe in in the incredible you really did and you know for me i don't know if it's a nostalgia thing but i actually prefer practical over cgi any day i just think it's incredible that that these creatures are brought to life either in like the predator or aliens you know mm -hmm. so many right. incredible pieces that you know people have sweated and bled over to make what we see <laughs> on screen. I mean, after, right. after Stan uh, sadly passed away, uh, you started a company called Legacy Effects, which is involved yes, we... in, uh, you know, the creative process of so many blockbusters. I mean, for all the viewers um, and listeners that may not know, um, who were Legacy Effects and what did they actually do? So Legacy Effects, besides myself, was Shane Mahan, Alan Scott, and Lindsay McGowan. And we had all uh, been showrunners and working for Stan for a million years. Uh, Shane and I both got started on The Terminator. Uh, we picked Lindsay up in England working on Aliens, so he joined us a ways back. And I hired Alan Scott on Terminator 2. And we all became very close and worked on all these great projects for Stan. And you know, we were very lucky that Stan entrusted us with being showrunners and, and working on these, these projects and, and having a face on set because it became an easy transition mm -hmm. once we had to do it ourselves because we had been doing it. Stan had given us that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, most, most recently you worked on The Mandalorian which I've got to say is one of the most incredible series to hit the screens in many, many years. And it actually uh, started the whole Dis Dis Disney Plus franchise. Uh, so for, for again, for the wonderful audiences, I mean, what was your involvement in the three seasons of The Mandalorian? Or is that well, such a, a big yeah, quest question? It's true. Answer? It was three seasons plus there was the Book of Boba Fett. Mm. And then um, I also worked on... Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi, that series. And, you know, John Favreau was this is sort of the driving force behind it, along with Dave Filoni. And they wanted to stay true to the early franchise uh, Star Wars movies and do as much practical as we could. And the baby Yoda, as he's known to the world, but Grogu, <laughs> Uh, I saw that as an opportunity to to really try to make a puppet, and uh, at first it was just going to be referenced for CG, but but you know we got we got it to this to screen, got a test, and I showed John the test of you know how it worked and all its warts and all its good things and how to shoot it and uh, from my point of view anyway they did an amazing job shooting it and bringing it to life but i think they saw a potential in it and once mm. we got it on set everyone started to fall in love with it and you know the timing was just perfect for for that and the way he was not introduced was was an was an amazing marketing coup <laughs> and i think it really surprised audiences who tuned in for the Mandalorian? We had uh, built the Mandalorian and all kinds of creatures for those those shows, uh, along with uh, Grogu. But you know, oh, it was a whole cast of those characters that we were building and designing and creating for the series. Mm -hmm. It was a great I'm, opportunity. I mean, your really crea creations on this show. Um, literally cost me so much money in, in merchandise. <laughs> I, I should have shares in Disney right now for my girls. I wish we all did, right? I know. <laughs> it would be nice, wouldn't it? Back to George Lucas days where you got a uh, a share of the uh, the shares of the profit. Royalties. Of, of, yeah. yeah, the royalties. Uh, so with John Favreau and Dave Filoni being so hands-on throughout the whole process of The Mandalorian, how involved were they in the way of the design and what you you did with legacy effects in in the way of creating right. these characters i mean how much input did they have well they had a lot of input and doug chang i'd be remiss not to mention he and his team which were we all worked together 
and uh, there'd be artwork created by uh, Doug Chang's group, and then John Dave would weigh in, and then they bring me in to, to look at it too, because now we got to make this thing work and make it practical and uh, figure out, yeah, we can work with that. Uh, or if we tweak this a little bit, it'll, it'll work better. And so it became sort of a, uh, a process where we're all working together. But I, I think it always would kind of defer to John's gut instinct, you know, what his, mm -hmm. you know, would I want to play with this when I was uh, 10 years old? <laughs> and uh, I think that in a way it was like creating this uh, art box for Dave and John of all of the Star Wars characters they wish they would have had. So I mean, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I mean, you've worked on so many suits uh, throughout your career in so many different mo movies, but obviously the Mandalorian suit of armor is very classic. I, I mean, how many versions of that did Legacy go through before it got signed off to say, this is the final design? Well, luckily, Doug Chang went through that process. So there were sketches that were uh, paintings that were approved. But then once again, you have to uh, make it work on the on the actor. And uh, the stunt performer, uh, Brendan, which the suit was created around, he kind of came in in the 11th hour. And so we had to remake everything to sort of tailor and fit him mm -hmm. in short order. And uh, it became very iconic, but luckily we had a nice blueprint to go by, but then we 3D sculpted everything over, you know, the actor's form and, you know, went from there. And, and luckily with those Boba Fett slash... Uh, you know, the Mandalorian, there's some soft parts too. So that mm. gives you a little leeway, the pants and the shirts underneath the armor to help. I mean, how many, how, many, how many suits were made? I mean, how many suits oh my are there gosh. out there? Because obviously, bearing in mind, the Mandalorian mo mo movie is now being made as we speak. So, I yep, mean, for the, ser for the series, how many suits were made? Uh, well, that's a good question. Here is in in uh, the first uh, episode, uh, first episodes, first season, there was twelve suits made alone. There was six stunt, six uh, for the hero, and that that was because they worked side by side. And he went through all these changes, all these iterations of him being damaged. Uh, mm -hmm. That fight with Mudhorn, he he takes quite a beating there. <laughs> And so there was actually, there were some in-between stages too. There's, a, a, you know, a 3.A or 3.5 or a 3A or whatever. Because, yeah, you know, you need to see a little bit more here or there. So in season one, there's at least probably 12, 14 suits made. Season two, I, to be honest, I, I sort of lost track. I mean, because we had a... Constantly remake and fix what was already made. Plus, we'd make a few new ones each season. Mm -hmm. And then Book of Boba Fett. And then the, uh, when Boba Fett sort of appears at the end, uh, I think it was of season two, there, there was a iteration there of him. There's a lot of suits. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just it's just fantastic to see. I mean, the de the de detail on them are just in, you know really incredible. And do you know what's really nice is at comic cons now you've got people that are are putting their hearts and soul into recreating these suits, and they do such an amazing job, uh, which do. must be really sort of sort of humbling to see your work being replicated by fans worldwide. Well, we went through it too with Boba Fett because, you know, as one of the guys uh, on my team, Trevor Hensley was a huge Boba Fett fan and he knew all of the iterations and the differences between Empire and, uh, you know, Return of the Jedi. And, and there's all these nuances and damage and, and things mm. that become important 
when you're doing the series, at least with the Mandalorian, we got to create it ourselves. Then you have to follow suit and match what you did. But it's a lot easier when you have it right in front of you or you did it rather than with Boba Fett. You're looking at photographs and pictures and and, and what would happen in the with Boba Fett is one minute you'd see a stunt one that didn't have the same damage or it had more damage to it than the other one. And so you, yeah. it, it just continuity. It was, it was crazy. But the fans will swear it's it's a certain way. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the fans of Star Wars are very passionate, to say the least. Yeah, they uh, are. I yes, mean, I are. love the movies, but it just amazes me the amount of knowledge that some of these fans have got. Literally, they live Star Wars day and night, which is incredible. So I yes, was speaking to Brendan Wayne not long ago, and okay. I, I've spoken to a few others, including Misty Roses as well. And okay. they were saying that on set... Uh, people had to be very careful with Grogu because he was extremely expensive. I mean, how <laughs> precious was Grogu? And, well, you know, how, there, how, how many guards did he have to have around him? <laughs> so there's two things that was going on. In season one, we were trying to keep it a secret. So it, it was under wraps because John wanted it to be revealed once you saw the show. And because he knew if he sent it off to China to make toys or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. lunch boxes or whatever, they, you know, all the all the merchandising stuff, someone would leak it. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the mindset was, well, we got to get all this merchandise. Christmas is coming up. It's going to release in October. And John stood fast. And I think his decision was wise that let's surprise the audience with this character. Now, what happened was, I think it was in the, in the scene, the speeder scene, when those, those two troopers were punching him. Yeah. <laughs> John Favreau said to them, hey, stop it. He's, that's a $5 million character, a $4 million character. It's no, he was just exaggerating. He just wanted them to, to not hurt the puppet. And the puppet cost nowhere near that. I wish I'd gotten four or five million dollars. <laughs> it's not even in the one million dollar range. It's not even close. Well, you but, never know in the future if it goes up to, to auction. I mean, I, well, I, I, I was I was chat, chat, chatting to Lauren right. and and um, a X Wing went for two point five million dollars. So well, you're right. Once it comes to that. <laughs> but I'll never. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, 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 of course not. I mean, I mean, no. we've all fallen in love with Gro Grogu, and we've seen this magic that you you've presented on screen. But I'm sure it didn't come without its challenges. I mean, what sort of challenges did you face? You know, to bring Gro Grogu to life on screen, because again, it's a real character. It's not CGI, and it's it's so well articulated and the emotions and it's just amazing i mean how many how many challenges did you face well every step of the way there's a huge team behind grogu and you know there's the guys that sculpted it there's glenn hans there's scott Patton, there's the whole team that molded it there's the people that cast it and uh you know i wanted to get this translucency in the ears so they had to get the silicone consistency just right so you could see through it if it was backlit and it'd get that pink bunny ear kind of thing. I mean, there's so many, the painters, the guys, John Cherevka and Ryan Pintar, painting all the details, painting all the eyes, custom building all these things. There's Pete Clark who did all the amazing mechanics in it and servos and then there's a group of us that puppeteered it. And I think, you know, the analogy of like kind of coming together as a band, everybody knows their role and kind of can anticipate and feed off of the other guy what they're doing and then whatever the actor's doing and then whatever direction you have. So it becomes a spontaneous performance in a, in a lot of ways. And each take is a little different. 
and each take you sort of build on it. It's like, oh, that was that was great. Let's do that again, but add this to it, and so it 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 becomes alive, and you you notice the other actors how they react to it, and acting is nothing but reacting, really, mm. and so and there's an amazing cast of characters in Star Wars, I mean, in The Mandalorian. And so, you know, these actors would help us just by their performance. Mm. So uh, it, it sort of just comes together. And this team that puppeteered it, we had been together, we've been together for so many years doing the Jurassic Parks and Iron Man and all these different things and puppeteering and characters and commercials and, you know, from the Aflac duck to, you know, a full-blown T-Rex. So we all sort of had a shorthand with each other. Do you know what? I love it how you just casually just throw those names out there. Do you know, do you know <laughs> what I mean? Oh, Jurassic Park and, you know, <laughs> just these small movies that maybe no one ever knows. I mean, who knows? <laughs> but, um, but <clears throat> I mean, how, how long did it take to get from page to the finished article i mean how long is that pro process of say making it's Grogan pretty from... short is it yeah it was pretty short on uh, on on a tv schedule it's it's short on movies nowadays mm. if you have four months you're lucky wow from uh, from the inception to having to get it ready to start rehearsing mm. it, it goes by pretty quick I mean, the days of jurassic park where you had a over a year to build dinosaur and, and you know to be truthful we needed that time back then mm. there was a lot of ground being broken but now what we do is sort of feed off of something else that we've done that was successful and so y you build up a playbook and you, you kind of well we're going to do this like we did the baby raptor or, or you know you call it out and everybody sort of knows Mm -hmm. that process or, or what it needs to be so baby yoda was uh you know i don't know countless commercials that we've done there's different ways of articulating things and in those commercials you have to come up with something genius in a couple of couple three weeks mm -hmm. so and i have to say the digital process and this goes back to stan you know embrace it you know, don't mm. be afraid of it. Include it into your workflow. See how it can, can help you. And it did. With, say, Grogu, it, it was amazing because Pete, it was originally 3D sculpted. Mm. So we had that file. So then as we're detailing a clay press of it for the skin, Pete Clark already had the a digital model of it so he could start building his mechanics inside so everything was moving parallel with each other as in the old days it wasn't the case you had to get the mold done and then you'd hand it over to the mechanics and then they'd start working inside but by having everything digital like this and honestly 3d printers you know printing FDM parts and things that would, would directly go into the mechanics and replace machining and heavier metals you know you've got grown plastics that are really strong uh, it's just taking advantage of every tool at our disposal to figure out how to get to the uh, end line imagine if uh, the the um, you know the magicians back when star wars first came out if they had the technology now to make it would be crazy it really really would i mean did george lucas ever come onto the, uh, he did. the work workshop he, floor he never came to the workshop but he came to the set mm. and uh, once uh i want to say it was season two i think it might have been after grogu's success and or, or maybe it wasn't i i honestly just don't remember but he, he showed up and, uh, you know, well, another proud father, you know, because <laughs> he, he, he gave birth to the series. He gave birth to these ideas and everybody. So he definitely has uh, 
a claim to it, a little lineage there. <laughs> so, so obviously, you had quite a lot of effects on the Mandalorian from character creations to other effects. I mean, you know, how challenging was it on 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 set? Because you know, you created um, Queel for for Misty Ro- Ro- Roses to right. be in, right. and she said that how how it was a, cl- a collaborative you know experience it wasn't just her it was her and and the team in legacy effects that actually mm. they all pulled together I, I mean how challenging was it on set you know working day in day out i mean was there anything that didn't go to plan that you had to think quickly on your feet uh, you know what we were pretty lucky things uh <laughs> a well oiled machine you're, you're <laughs> you you are shooting the prototype of everything that you make. It's not like a Porsche where you build a prototype mm. and test it for years and then you uh, come out with the product. You you create this thing in a few months and you go to set with it and then it better work because when you're in front of that camera, all eyes are on you and if a thing doesn't work, well... Mm. <laughs> We don't want to think about that, <laughs> but uh, you know, fortunately, we have we have built on. You know, I was with Stan for 25, 25 years alone, and uh, time with <coughs> Legacy. I mean, I was in the business. <coughs> pardon me, for forty years. So. We we had a lot of experience to draw upon, of what worked, what didn't work, and you kind of go there. I, I mean, not everything always works. Uh, sometimes you try to do too much, just because uh, everyone's of the mindset. Well, it worked great in this. Let's see if we can do that. Mm-hmm. So you give it a try, but. What was nice about the Mandalorian is there was no promises, and everyone, uh, I mean, the things that we did promise that we would do, we we did. But there's a few adventures where you try, and Mm -hmm. you get better. And we got better, and by the second season, it it, in the third season, and the Book of Boba Fett, I mean, the building blocks are there. You're building more various kinds of puppets, self-contained ones, you know, everything, you you know, it would be great if we would do this and have that. And, and people then realized it. I mean, because if you think back on the first one, it was a big experiment, mm. a bold experiment, because it wasn't even supposed to work. It was going to be a reference piece, maybe use it here or there. Wow. But it worked. But, but it, 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 it but it did. Worked. It worked. Yeah, it, it really came to life, and it had a little personality, and it became uh, became a thing. I yeah. mean, I mean, out how out of the whole season uh, seasons of Mandalorian, ha- have you got a proudest mo- moment? You know, on set or off offset of working on the actual show. Well, I'm very blessed to have been on all of them. But I have to say, there was the scenes where we were working with Mark Hamill and uh, the double for him. And I think Grogu was really coming into his own. And you could hear a pin drop on that set because the crew was invested in him at this point in time. And they were waiting to see what Grogu was going to do. And... Us puppeteers, I think there was a moment there where we sort of vanished. And he became his own thing. And no one was looking at us anymore. And the whole crew was just looking at him. And, you know, hats off to ILM, who would come in and save our (laughs) butts by removing the rods and whatever. But I think that scene where Grogu's trying to decide whether he wants to go the Jedi route or stay with his friend, the Mandalorian. I think that was uh, 
that was one of those those proud moments and it was incredible scene to watch i would lie if i i, I say i didn't i didn't shed a tear because it was emotional uh, you know from it was the, mo the moment you saw the x-wing fly in and you got excited to then you know being <laughs> invested in this character it, it was amazing i mean did any of you shed a tear on set or was it completely a different sort of feeling when when you were shoot shooting that scene it was different in that you're on and you're but you're lost in in mm. in in the character i mean you are projecting yourself into him and you're you're trying to time everything just right and so you're you're pretty um i don't know um uh, in the moment with mm. the character so mm. but seeing it and reading it and seeing it back is when the emotion and i'm glad it it it, it could stir an emotion so yeah. i mean this made the silicone and metal and <laughs> <laughs> yeah cloth after, and after the scene you just, you just put it into like a box and close the box and just forget about it uh, which must be very very strange uh to do when <laughs> you're so invested in in that character as well uh, i wanted to ask um just gen general questions now about the industry because from when you started in the 80s to now what do you think's been the biggest change for practical effects and creature create creation within the industry? Well, there's a couple of things, two storylines going on. One is technology has advanced things to where we can we can create the art at a new level because everyone's looking for bigger and better each mm. time, and they don't have as much money or time, so by using the technology we've we i say we there's a big group of us uh, the whole team at legacy has figured out how to get from point a to point b quicker and not lose anything in the art the other difference is the environment of filmmaking and television in general uh when i first started out it was more about the director and I would say in some it's probably not completely fair to say this but it felt like it was more art driven and now it feels a little more corporate driven there's a lot more layers to go through to get to uh, the answer mm -hmm. you know there's a lot more people that have to weigh in and, and help craft Mm -hmm. everything whereas it felt a little more running gun and streamlined you know if james cameron was good with it or steven spielberg say no more we're moving mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. uh and so i guess that's how i was brought up in the industry and my my film school was probably the first terminator so <laughs> that's well, it can't How be bad. I learned. Do you know what I mean? You know, what a way to, way to learn. Um, have you kept any keepsakes from your many projects that you've been be, been on? Is it like a man room somewhere in your place that's <laughs> it's full not. of suits and animal pieces and, and creature? creature that's effects? all at that legacy. Whatever, whatever they could have, it's still there. Uh, no, you know what? I felt like I did enough of it when I was there that I, I, I mean, I have a couple little things. I have a little sketch by Dave Filoni. I have uh, these little coins that that were that John Favreau would give out, and you know, I have some written things from James Cameron and. I have a signed poster from Steven Spielberg. But I don't really have that much. It, it's no. just, um, it's all, it's all here. It's all the emotion and the experience. I think. Well, I suppose if you've worked on so many great movies like you have, John, I suppose it's like working in a chocolate factory and not wanting to have chocolate <laughs> afterwards. Do you know what I mean? You've, 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 you've experienced it all. <laughs> so I just want to name a few of the films that you've been um, work well but that that you've worked on, and I just want you to give me like a short, quick sort of answer on on what it okay. was like to work on them. So, so first of all, Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. I was 
warned, you know, Steven Spielberg is, uh, he's a taskmaster. He's really tough. And I thought, well, gosh, I've done all these James Cameron films. If it's harder than that, then I'm in for an experience. But it, uh, it was a landmark experience. It really was from so many levels of what happened there. And it was great working with Steven Spielberg. He is, he's a master. And then the next film is Terminator. Terminator was this young director that could do everything. He could draw, he could paint, he could, he could sculpt, he could write, he could direct, he could grab the camera and shoot it, he could light it. Uh, he was amazing and he, he continued on. Every single film, uh, whether it be Aliens, whether it be uh, Avatar 1 and 2, Aliens, it's just James Cameron is uh, he's exceptional. And then we've got The Avengers. The Avengers was amazing run with Marvel, and it, it felt like all these characters, all these things that we were doing really came together on that one. That was magic in the, in the new, new world of movie making. I, I, I've actually had the opportunity to have my hands on the screen used um, Iron Man helmet from Civil ah. War, um, which I've got to say is incredible. Even up close, the quality and the workmanship. And then I've actually held the hero version of Captain America's shield that was used on screen. And I've got to say either Chris Evans is very, very strong or something's not right because that shield is heavy. It is a heavy shield. I felt like a, a little kid when I lift, lift, lifted that up, I've got to say. I, I think there's, we didn't do the shield, but we did his helmet and we did all the Iron Man suits and helmets and things. But I think there was a couple different versions of that. You know, there'd be for the hero photographed, mm. oh, this a shield. And then there'd be a lighter work, lighter weight version. <laughs> You're just making me feel better now that there's going to be a lighter <laughs> version in there. He's not going to be throwing that about. And then we've got um, a recent one, Avatar, which, again, incredible. Another groundbreaking film. Uh, well, it was on that one for over four years. And we were doing practical things and designing digital characters, obviously, because it was going to be digital. But uh after that one was done it was everyone re referred to the movie you're working on as in the post avatar world you know mm. is a different became a different way of working after avatar as it did with the other james cameron films i mean mm. he's, he's a pioneer he definitely is do you know what? i can remember watching that the cinema in 3d and it just blew my mind um, it's just everything about about that film, especially Stephen Lang as well, which I'm a massive fan yeah. of. He's an incredible, incredible actor. And then the next one I want to ask you about. So looking at your IMDb, believe it or not, this is the film that I got most excited about. And people out there are going to scream at the screen right now because they'll be saying, what do you mean he's worked <laughs> on this and this? But Monster Squad. Uh, you know, I have a soft spot for that one because... Um, guys that wrote that script and Fred Decker was one one of the writers and he was also a director on that I think he took all of our uh, boyhood fantasies about the universal monsters and made them work together in a movie and so it was a chance to sort of uh, have an updated homage to the reason I got into this business because I, I wanted to make Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman, Dracula, the mummy, the creature, all those things. Those were the movies that first piqued my interest when I was like five years old. It's like, wow, King Kong, what? Mm. <laughs> you know? Do you know, I even had a gang of my own after watching that uh, dedicated to the Monster Squad. But I wanted to ask you as well, because you were, <laughs> you were a head sculpture on that. I mean, is there a, like a hierarchy at Stan Winston from like the tea maker to the head sculpture person or yeah it, you know everyone always wanted to be the guy that sculpted the head or did the, <laughs> the glory thing 
And I'm sure that fed all our egos or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I got to do this. But you wanted to create an iconic character in, at Stands and at Legacy. Luckily, we've had that opportunity to create lots of iconic characters. And, um, you know, you're just in that process of doing it. You feel proud and you put your heart and soul you put your heart and soul into all of them, the good ones and the bad ones. You know, mm. people say, what's your favorite? You know, it's easy to go to the ones that were highly successful, but the things are, is that you work just as hard on the ones that aren't that good because it's your name up there. It's mm. your, or it's your team, it's your company. It's, so the work has to speak for itself. Mm. I mean, you we don't worked. write them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you've worked yeah. with so many great actors as well because you've worked on a lot of makeup on them from Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, Danny DeVito. I mean, has has there been one actor that's been your fa favorite to work sort of on and with? Oh, there are uh, so many of them. I, I mean, I enjoyed working with John Voight. Uh, I turned him into FDR, and I remember going to a meeting with them uh, with all the brass making that because I'd taken drawings of um, and kind of did some overlays of real FDR with John Voight and I wanted to show them the differences in facial structure and you, you can't all you can do is build out with makeup mm. you can't take away so what I said there was I'll give you the essence of FDR it won't be a precise replica. Fortunately, most of the audience probably couldn't tell you what FDR really looked like anyway. But mm. he 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 was he was fun because he he was important to him to get it right. And you know, uh, most of the actors I've worked with, they're um, they really care about their craft and. Uh, I'm really lucky when they embrace a makeup and they want it and they want it and they like how it takes them to a, a it creates a, another character mm. sort of instantly for them. Mm. And uh, yeah, I remember Danny DeVito in Batman Returns when we created the penguin look for him and he had it on and it was just like, he was just blown away. It's like, I don't have to do a damn thing. I just <laughs> are him already a penguin. <laughs> he was creepy as the penguin, I've got to say. It's he was. so creepy, he but was. so amazing. But I love that video of you with Ar Ar Arnold when you're showing him the rail gun. And it, oh. it looks it looks like it's a bit heavy for you, but then Arnold just picks it up like it's a toothpick. Do you know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, yeah, this is all right. Uh, but no, that's great. I mean, with all your experience and all your stories i should imagine over these many what four four decades is there any sort of rumblings of a memoir of a book um you know sort of your life's experience well somebody else would have to write it <laughs> i would be happy to sit down and and help them do it i haven't ever thought about it but you know it it, it is sort of true if you think about it i sort of came up in the middle of the 80s in the heyday of all this hey if there's a young writer out there that wants to do it contact me <laughs> because we are fascinated more and more recently with behind the scenes uh disney are doing a lot right. a lot of like behind the scenes and it's just incredible to see how this magic you know happens uh, which which is incredible to see, um, but you know what? I, if there is any writers out there, get it get in touch because I would definitely buy it. But buy it because there's so many, um, you know, stories there. I am sure from from your past. But John, you've been a great guest. It's been an absolute honor to have you on. And Thank you. Uh, I know there's probably <laughs> questions out there that people are saying, why didn't you ask this? Why didn't you ask that? But it's impossible because literally you've done everything. But out of the whole career, what, what do you feel is your shining moment? Well, I liked, I, I will say this. I thought I had a great beginning with the Terminator and a great end with Avatar 2 and the Mandalorian. 
It was a good way to bookend a career. And a man that's been busy for the majority of his career, like literally hands hands on. Apparently, a li- little birdie told me that you're retired, which I cannot Damn. believe at all. You don't look old enough to be retired. So obviously, <laughs> you know, you've either got a great pension or you've retired extremely early. What are you filling your time with currently? Because it can't, it's got to be hard. Surely you can't just sit down and relax being a man that's been hands on for so long. You know, I'm still hands on with my own little sculptures and painting and uh, I do miniature stuff and it's a it's a fun world. I, I, I am completely consumed by it and nobody I don't have to answer to anybody but me. And uh, <laughs> that's, there, you- that, that's that's being retired, which is great. That is awesome. John, look after yourself. For all the viewers and listeners, don't forget to hit subscribe. Join us next week for another great interview. John, you've been a great guest. Look after yourself you. and keep, you. keep, keep safe, my friend. <laughs>